Hey, what is up, everybody? It's uh, Chris Grant here with Garland Sullivan. And uh, I want to, first of all, want to say thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. Uh, Garland, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks guys, for having we're going to get started. Absolutely. We're going to get started in maybe three to five minutes. We're going to give everybody the chance to uh, trickle into the room a little bit. And then, of course, if you can't stay the whole time, we, we want you to. But if you can't, there will be a replay available. And I'll make sure that's up on my YouTube channel, and we'll post it in FBA Today as well. Um, I think we're going to have a fun time tonight. Uh, Garland is uh, Garland's got an interesting story and uh, and 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 a great business. Uh, and I know that he'll uh, he'll be sharing a lot about that tonight. So have your questions ready, and uh, and we'll get rolling here in uh, in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, if you want to let us know uh, where you're coming from, uh, where you guys are tuning in from. Would love to see that. Uh, let us know you can hear us okay. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll give you guys another couple of minutes. We'll get get rolling here. Awesome. Perfect. Garland, Garland, I forget. What part of Florida are you guys in? We're out of Jacksonville. So, basically the armpit of Florida. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we've been here for four years now. It's It's honestly been a great place to be. I love Jacksonville. Nice. Where did you guys move from? So we were in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So okay. that's in the middle of nowhere, 30 miles east of Oklahoma City. And we went to college there at Oklahoma Baptist University. And the only reason we ended up in Jacksonville was because <coughs> of because of Max. Max was training for the Olympics there. Oh, nice. Right here in Jacksonville. Nice. There. All right, Grant from Washington. How's it going, man? Vance in D.C. Scott, I hope the battery uh, stays charged for you, man. We got Atlanta, CJ in Jacksonville. Awesome. What's up? <laughs> L.A., Greenville, Las Vegas, Kalamazoo. Um, wow, I haven't been to Kalamazoo in years. I've got family in Kalamazoo, but since uh, since I'm a Buckeye fan, I... I don't make it to Michigan very often. Uh, I like this webinar jam. This one's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, it's gotten a lot better over the last couple of years, which has been nice. Uh, it used to be horrible, but it was the only thing that didn't cost $1,000 a month. Oh, I'm sure. <clears throat> I like that shirt you got on. Hey, thanks, man. I don't know if anybody else got these, uh, if you whether you went or didn't go, but uh, Rocky Mountain was great. I got to see Garland there, and there were a ton of other people. It was an excellent time. The uh, uh, the networking events that Paul and Travis put on were excellent. Spot on. Miami, Rockville, New York. Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to give it another minute or so, and then we're going to get rolling. Uh, I don't want to wait too long. I know that you guys are uh, you guys were timely, so we can let people trickle in as they please. Uh, let's see here. Make sure we've got everything ready to go. All right. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get rolling. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here again. Um, we've got Garland Sullivan. Uh, if you guys don't know him, he is a, uh, a retail arbitrage master out of uh, Florida. Oh, we got another Garland Sullivan coming on. That, that's not me. Someone's hacking. <laughs> Let me eject that. All right, there we go. Uh, Garland, is, uh, Garland is a mostly retail arbitrage seller out of Florida. Um, I know that you guys are, are kind of uh, doing some different things in the coming year, but we're mostly going to talk about retail arbitrage tonight. Um, Garland, thanks again for being here, man. I appreciate it. Uh, let's get started a little bit by talking about how you guys got started, kind of what your backstory is. If I'm not mistaken, I know that we've done this one other time. Uh, I believe there's a loan shark 
type story that you can tell us. Okay. Uh, I can, I can so, add some light on that. All right. So let us know. Uh, let us know how that all went down and, and how you guys got into Amazon. Sure. So my business partner is Max Abreu, and we were college roommates, also college athletes. We were both swimmers, and that's how we really became great friends and really knew each other's work ethic. And we started dabbling in Amazon and part part time in college. And the next thing you know, we were like, hey, I think we might be able to make a business out of this. So our roommate's girlfriend's friend was doing FBA full time arbitrage about 10 months ahead of us. And he was in Dallas, Texas, and he was actually doing really, really well with the business. So that's when we realized, okay, you know what? I really think we could go for this and we can really make a business out of this. So my business partner, Max, he's from Paraguay. So he was going to train for the Olympics for a year, year and a half for throughout 2016. We finished in 2014. So he had two more years of training that he was going to go committing to, to go for the Olympics. Whereas I was, I was done with swimming. Um, I had enough. And that was the reason why we partnered up. We were like, Hey, look, I'll, ru I'll run the business on the day to day for the first year and a half or so. And then he'll step in afterwards. So in that first year, we went through all kinds of messes and we definitely learned a lot. We got suspended twice. We took money from people that we didn't know or trust, but it, uh, we made it happen and really just put our nose down to it and took retail arbitrage to the next level. Within that first year, we were able to break a million dollars in revenue and just have more than doubled ever, ever since. That's awesome. Now, um, you guys use retail arbitrage and, and you talk a little bit about getting suspended. What, what kind of mistakes did you guys make early on that, uh, that got you suspended? I know you're not making these mistakes now, but, uh, it's good to know that even you are human. So, uh, what kind Every of mistakes single were, mistake were possible? Every single one is what we've done. Oh my goodness. So, Anywhere from labeling the, the wrong item, sending too large of a weight limit, uh, not polybagging poly you know, a plush item, a clothing item, putting in, uh, not checking products thorough enough. And honestly, that's why we ended up going, getting suspended. We, one, we didn't know what a performance notification was. So we just saw that little flag thing at the top and we're like, okay, whatever. And uh, sure enough, Amazon really cares about how quickly you re you respond to those messages. So when we were, you know, beginning, we saw that notification. We're like, okay, I wonder what we need to do. And we didn't really ever do anything or pay attention to it. Next thing you know, our account gets shut down. And so we were sending in products that weren't checked properly. We were a lot of shoes, and I and that's what triggered it. It was shoes, uh, half boxed shoes. So we also weren't prepping the shoes properly. We weren't checking to make sure there's absolutely no residue on it. Any kind of, if, if someone had tried it on, it, it would, we didn't check it. We didn't wipe down every single one. We didn't tie the shoelaces. I mean, we, now we are anal about what we ship to Amazon and, and it, everything is pristine. If there's any kind of doubt, it's going into the return pile to not be put into Amazon. And, and really negligence. So the negligence of uh, not returning or responding to those performance notifications, and then also not doing great due diligence on our prepping process was really the reason why we got suspended during that time. That makes sense. And I, I think that's, as new sellers, I don't think that, I mean, it does need to be held against you, but I mean, that's something that, that's something everybody, everybody makes that kind of mistake. And even, even seasoned sellers still make that mistake. Uh, You'll even see some people talking about using commingle to try to get around that, which is irritating. Um, so I think it's I think the story regarding the uh, the guy who got you started or with a, with a little bit of capital is kind of funny. Okay. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm remembering correctly, and I, I I didn't go back and and review the video, it's still up on YouTube. Um, but if I remember correctly, you talked about him having like like that, uh, that chest hair and gold chains and all that stuff. Uh, okay. Can you talk a little bit about him and, and how, that, uh, how that helped or from, didn't help? For sure, for sure. Now, basically, this is what happened in our business. We, were, we came to the point where 
we couldn't get enough capital. We needed capital to hit our goal. We wanted to hit a million dollars in revenue. And this was in 2015. And so we'd been suspended in August. We, we were like, man, we, if we were, go through that again, there's no way we're going to hit our goal. And this is now mid September. I, I reach out to my banker who I met randomly at a poker match. Crazy. And through a guy from church. That was the funny thing. I met the guy that, from church that invited me to a poker game. And then we go to this poker game. I sit next to this guy and sure enough, he's a chase bank banker. And so I, the friend of me ends up being one of my best friends. He actually works from our warehouse now. And nice. uh, he just runs his own business, but he comes in and just works here just because it's a good environment. And so he, he was our go-to connect for, for funding for at first, you know, we, we reached out to family out outside of family. So like when you, you know, reached out to our, my, I had an aunt that gave me a, a credit card that had some money on it. And then also our, we had a cut co- Max had a cousin that gave him money, but this was the first time that we took money from someone that we did not know or have any kind of connection with. So Chase bank wouldn't give us a loan because we're too new of a company. You ne- typically need to have two years of tax returns to, to get into, get a, a nice l- line of credit or, or loan from a bank. And Chase is also a really big bank. So you're not going to, it's not likely that you're going to actually get a, a good good rate or be able to do business with them because it's all an algorithm on whether they want to do business with you. Whereas if you go to a small bank, you might have a good shot at getting a loan. So, so Lance tried to give us a loan. Lance is the banker. And sure enough, it, it wasn't happening. He's like, okay, I have one other option for, for you guys. Oh, so, all right. So we're like, tell me more. So this guy, his name is Robert. And we're going... He's like, I'm going to tell you about Robert. You're going to, he's a good big character. You're going to love him. I'm like, okay, that's what I get going into this meeting. We go into, open the door, turn to right. The lo- there's a long hallway. And, and you, you basically get this like, I'm getting goosebumps right now. As, as you go down this hallway, you see him at the very end, behind, perched up behind this big, nice uh, mahogany table. And he has, he has this big gold necklace, this sapphire, the big as, as big as your fist on one hand, a cigar on the other hand, long, white, slicked back hair, and a Cartier watch, or how do you say it, two guns sitting behind him. And, and, he, and he has it set up, he has it set up to where his chair is like super high. And then you sit at the table and you're like this, you're, you're way below him. So he, you're already on, he's on a, your different level playing field, no matter what. And and so we're like, okay, so this is our this is our guy that's gonna give us a bunch of money. Great. <laughs> and so we both, my, my Max, my business partner, and I kind of look at each other like, what are we getting into right here? I don't know about this. And sure enough, we tell him our story. We tell him about what we're doing, and and he's like, man, you know what? There was someone in my life when I was starting my business that helped me out, and I'm gonna do the same thing for you guys. And I, and we're like, oh wow, okay. And we're going into the business. We're going in the meeting. Like, hey, we we're looking to get about a hundred grand. Um, and he's like, no, 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 no. You're not getting a hundred grand. I'm giving you a hundred twenty-five grand, and I'm giving you a four hundred thousand dollar line of credit. And you guys are going to make the most out of this money. And you're going to make it, and you're going to pay me back. Y'all have a good one. I'll talk to you later. Basically, that was the meeting. No lie. And so. Sure enough, we took the money. We we spent one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in about three weeks. And we go back to Robert. We go, Robert, spent one hundred twenty five. I'm going to need another hundred. He goes, okay. Gives us a check for a hundred. Then spend that in like about a week and a half. I have about twenty thousand dollars left. I just received a, a payment from Amazon for about thirty thousand dollars, and we get suspended the next day. Wow. And this is this is November, November 18th. We get suspended. I have to give him a payment of fifty thousand dollars, November 19th. Oh wow! So I go I go into this meeting. I've never been so stressed in my life, you know. So I go into this meeting, knowing that I cannot tell him about our account being shut down. He was like, "Garland, how's how's it going? Oh, things are great. We're rocking. We're our business couldn't be any better." Here's your 50 grand. I look forward to seeing you next time, Robert. You know, I'm 
basically pooping my pants at this point because there's <laughs> basically there's nothing I I can do but BS for to spare the time, you know. So now I have 30 days. I have 30 days to come up with another 50 grand. And our account is shut down. My only our only revenue source. And so basically just started praying. <laughs> and straight straight up we we still kept on all of our uh we, we still kept on, I don't know what is up with that, but looks like there's another garland that joins our conversation occasionally. And, That's weird. And so we, uh, we we start praying, basically, and, man, we're, we're basically at the end of the rope. We're, we, we reach out to Jennifer, Jennifer Coulson. Uh, if anyone has been suspended or is going through a suspension, we use Jennifer Coulson. She's awesome. She... Uh, it was really quick to respond to us. She's done a great job and sent, sent our plan in action to us. And it was very affordable at the time. And basically we, we made it happen. We, we sent in a plan of action. We didn't hear back from Amazon and we'd hear back, you know, every three days or so and nothing would happen. And, and then I would send in another request and nothing would happen. And sure enough, December 7th is when we get back up on Amazon. December 7th was the best sales day we ever had in our, our whole career of selling on Amazon at that time because we had all this inventory at, at Amazon, but nothing was selling because we were shut down because this is all the stuff we were stocked up for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. I mean, we had a ton of inventory. So luckily enough, we, we were able to get our payment the 15th and sell enough inventory from the 7th to the 15th to make our payment on the 20th to pay Robert. And of course we tell him the whole story afterwards. And the beauty, this was the most amazing part, honestly. He, we tell him the story and he takes a big puff of his cigar and he just does it. This is just has this big smirk on his face where he just goes, it, and that was it. And we, he's like, I was like, uh, he had respect for us. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so you know what not to do, know what not to do again, right? Garland and Max. And he's like, and we're like, yes, sir. He's like, good job, guys. Well done. That's a, that's a great story. <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious if the, if the smirk was, he was proud of you guys or he's proud of the fact that he didn't have to use the guns on you. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope it was the first one. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, that's, that's a great story. So, so what happened after that? Uh, were, was it just you guys, uh, just you and Max at the time? Uh, did you have any employees or anything like that? So at the time we did have, we had two employees at the time and we still kept them on during the times that we were suspended. We had one employee during the first, first suspension. So during the times that we were suspended, we were shut down. Even though we were shut down, we still paid them. We still paid them that those, their top time and hourly because one, we, really do a good job or really put forth a lot of effort towards taking care of our team, especially when things are not good. You know, uh, I think we can always do a better job of taking care of our team. I really, we really do a really good job of or We try to do a very good job of taking care of our people. So, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you guys started to grow a team. Uh, what was the, um, what was the atmosphere you wanted to create and, and how did you, how did you find and, and nurture those relationships with, uh, with your team? So it was an interesting, it was interesting, interesting experience hiring people because in Jacksonville, we didn't know anyone. Our only connection was our swim coach's daughter. I know random, but our swim coach's daughter lived here in Jacksonville, has a family. And that was our only connection in, in Jacksonville, aside from some swimmers that Max swam with that were also training for the Olympics. And so those are, those are the only people we knew. So we, the best way for us to get plugged in, we joined a celebration church here in Jacksonville and there we love celebration. I'm, I sometimes go to celebration still. I've recently gone to started going to another church, but Max is still plugged in with celebration. I would say I'm still plugged in with celebration. At least the people there, amazing people, great people. And that's where we first found employees. We, uh, just went to church groups and then talked to people. And then the next thing you know, they, Hey, I need a job. I, Hey, what, what, what are, what are you paying? What are you looking for help for help with? And at the time, honestly, I, I wish I had recorded everything. It'd be awesome. Just going back and seeing like 
went, we were went from our garage and living room to our first, from our first shipment at our townhouse where all of our neighbors were elderly and trying to kick us out every other week to, to, uh, to now where we're in a pretty significant size warehouse. And it's, it, what we did was just connect with those groups of church and really talk with those people and really connect with good people and really get a good feeling for people. But I would say we, we did get very lucky. We have a really great team. Our, our team is, we've only had three people that are no longer with us on our company and our company in, in the last four years. So that's, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, um, absolutely. Have those guys just moved on to different jobs or have they moved on to their own businesses? We've had to let go of two people and then we've had to, um, where other people went to another job. One, one person in particular actually ended up becoming our direct competitor. Uh, oh, locally. Wow. So that was a lot of fun also. But since then we now have all of our employees signed on competes and also really try to build our, our team on a vision. Cause we, we believe we, our company can be a hundred million dollar company in five years. And we really build a team off of that vision. And so it doesn't matter if you're a warehouse guy, if you're a buyer, if you're a shopper, everyone knows their place. And if there's someone slacking in a certain area, that one person will step up and make sure that that is taken care of for sure. That's awesome. So much more, much more cohesion as a team than just treating them like employees. Yes. I, I rarely say they're my employees. It's weird for me to say that. I, I say, Oh yeah. Uh, CJ works with us. You know, that's that's the type of thing I say. I don't, yeah. It's weird for me to say, oh yeah, you're there. he's my employee. I feel like that's right. degrading almost. <laughs> and that's good. That's good. I I think that I think that a, a business, especially small businesses like the ones that that we all own or or work in, it's important to have that that camaraderie. Um, let's talk a little bit about what did you guys do to train your employees and or you know your team. Um, and and what kind of ongoing training do you have? How do you keep track of everything? I guess the the mechanics behind you know how you guys have been able to grow. So, as you grow a business, you know originally you're you're in the trenches. You are the one fully doing everything basically. Whereas you're especially in our business as a retail arbitrage business, you buy product, you can bring it back to your house or your your garage or your warehouse, and then you prep it yourself and then you ship it out. Well, that was the first thing that we had to fix was if the only way that we were going to scale is if, if one person would be prepping while the other person is buying. So we found someone to prep products for us while the other person would, would buy products. And then, then it got to the point where I couldn't buy all the products and I hired people to buy products for the, for the guys that are prepping. Now, obviously I gave the opportunity to the person that was prepping originally to go buy first before hiring on a prepper because um, I think it's one, I want that person that was originally with us as a prepper to, to level up, you know, cause as a, as a prepper, you're not, you're not on as much of an, a commission ability. You can't, unless you really go out, out of your way, outside of your hours and, and really grind to, to make a good commission on, on a, as a prepper. And so, whereas a commission buyer, they can basically pick and choose when they want to work. And that's how that's how we structure it in our business. We have commissioned buyers, and and it's structured differently. If you are salary plus commission, or or commission or fully commission based, or if you're a satellite location. So basically, there's three different tiers of of how we structure it. Fascinating. The, that satellite location sounds interesting. I, I would imagine they get to run their own team of sorts uh, with that kind of, of operation. They do. Uh, our larger buyers here actually in Jacksonville have their own teams underneath them. And so they run their own team under themselves uh, and up to, you know, anywhere from three to six people will be under those, those two main buyers. And then under the guy that's our set, we have two satellite locations right now. And those are actually just one man shows and they drop off to prep centers to, to fulfill the orders or fulfill do the fulfillment. Nice. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. <clears throat> um, sorry, I was trying to think where I was going to go from there. Um, oh, uh, Grant, Grant's curious, how big, how big is your team? Uh, since sorry if that was already addressed, I don't think we hit that. 
Uh, so it's hard to say because you know we have we have people um, they're in the Philippines. We have we have three to four employees in the Philippines, um, one part time, and then we also have um, nine people on payroll here in in Jacksonville. But then you have probably another four people under those those two main buyers, the three to three to six people depending on like part time labor that comes in. So it's hard to say exactly. I, I like to say 15, but if you were to like count every single person, you might get like 21 or something like that. But, you know, it's hard to say. Awesome. Uh, and Michael has a good question. What uh, what do you think is more important? Cash flow, processes, people, uh, and I guess I'd add in and why? Well, we, we I would say we do a good job of putting our, our people first uh, on a lot of things. Um, we offer a lot of benefits to our employees. We have... 401k, uh, we have health insurance. We also have, um, uh, lost my train of thought. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, 401k, health insurance, we have um, paid time off uh, of four weeks. And you get all of this after after uh, six months of being with the company. Now, if you're a commission buyer, you don't get, you don't get the benefits, but if you're a salaried employee or an hourly employee, you are open to the benefits after six months. And then if you, whatever time off, everyone gets four weeks time off or six, six days and time off is the same. And if whatever you don't spend during those four weeks, whatever it is, so like say I have four weeks and I use two of them, the other two, that the, the two left, half of the two left would get bonused out at the end of the year. So it, it, it kind of incentivizes the person not to take time off if if they that way they're like getting a bonus if they don't want to take their time off but if they want to take their time off they can take their time off it, it's what it is we we try not to have everyone take off at the same time because it's you know a small company and and only we only recently we had an issue with that uh one of our our, our main preppers uh he he took two weeks off and <laughs> our guys it was a struggle and it honestly was a great blessing because we we didn't realize that we had that many hiccups in our business in, when one person was out, you know, because everything was smooth, so smooth, and everything's great. But then the next thing you know, you realize someone leaves and you're like, whoa, why are these issues happening? So then now we've we've instantly changed and, and fixed those issue, issues and problems so that way it doesn't happen again. And, and we wouldn't have ever fixed that if, if he hadn't have gone out of town, you know. So yeah, absolutely. It, it's definitely a good blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what uh, I guess, <clears throat> where did you where did you guys focus to scale up? Uh, was it cash flow? Was it um, oh, uh, was it you know just buying as much as you can? I guess what's what are the important metrics you guys look at when when buying inventory? So it all depends on what our cash flow is at the time. So we definitely shoot for products that move faster. Now, obviously there are opportunities that we do, but go deep on say a discontinued product. Like the largest, our most profitable SKU ever was a volleyball that we bought over a hundred thousand dollars worth. And it took a year to sell, but it took a year to sell, but we made 150 grand profit. And, and that I think that's those are, in those scenarios. We're, we're okay with that, that cash flow issue. Now, I would say we try to stick to turning inventory now because as soon as we get more cash, we can spend more money and our guys it just cycles through quicker and quicker and quicker. And we're definitely getting more and more into the competitive stage. And we're also getting to larger volumes. So our, whenever we tie up capital like that, say for a year, that is, that hurts your business, honestly. And even though that you're now, if I was a one man show, and I didn't have all these employees and I basically could just, I would only buy discontinued products and I would just let them sit there and just in my warehouse and then trickle them in as the year went on. If I just did it all by myself and I could easily do that and it would be easy, you know, but we're not trying to do that. We're trying to grow and scale a business and that's what we're focusing on now is really, really volume based. That's great. Um, let's talk, since you guys and your team does so much retail arbitrage, uh, I would imagine that you guys get to, or you guys focus on building relationships, 
because you are, I would, I would imagine you're clearing out a lot of places. Um, so how important are relationships in retail arbitrage and what do you do to grow those relationships uh, and then strengthen them and make sure that they stay profitable for both you and the other person in the future? So retail arbitrage, I would say re relationships are a huge key in our business. And, and it's just as simple as getting their contact, checking in with them, asking the managers what their sales quotas are. And that's, that's something one of our guys does a really good job of is he, he makes sure that he connects with every single manager, brings them, say, a Starbucks gift card when they help him out. And it, and it can be as simple as a $5 Starbucks gift card in it. And he's had managers cry on him for a Starbucks gift card. That girl must have had like a horrible day. But if you give someone a gift of like something that's sincere and they're not expecting it, it you really just made their day and they're, ne they're never going to forget that. And, and as long as you're intentional about it and you're not, and you're really there to build a relationship and be sincere, you can really, really do a good job of, of having those managers call you, be the go-to person to call you and making sure that, Hey, look, we're having the sales weekend. I'd love for you to come in. We need to sell that, sell this much. I'm trying to hit the sales quota. And like, and then we approach them saying, Hey, what do we need to do to help you make your sales quota? And they're like, Oh wow. these guys actually care about me. And then you remember their name and their daughter's name and their daughter just had a softball game. So you go, Hey, how did, how did Sarah do it? Her softball game. And they're like, Whoa, how did, how did you remember that? And it's th those little things are the ones that really set you apart from anywhere, anywhere else. And that's the yeah. same to go with wholesale also. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really important. I, I try to tell people how important that is. And, and I think it's, Coming from somebody who has a has a large business, I think that's important to hear. Uh, Travis has a great question. Um, at what revenue number did you start adding benefit programs uh, and other big company type programs to your business? And what made you choose that particular moment to add those things? Good question, Travis. I would say when when we decided to really um, really look at ourselves, like, hey, look, we are actual business now you know this isn't just max and i working out of a garage that we're actually a legitimate company we have a significant warehouse we have people that we need to take care of and we're like man we we should start offering these kind of things and honestly it was it was one of our one of our employees came on from the banking industry and and that was kind of, not really the, the turning point but it was really kind of like whoa we need to start offering these kind of of benefits too, and especially um, especially millennials want to. All of everyone in our crew, I believe, maybe one might be a Gen Z, whatever the new one is, but it is basically a millennial. And and at the end of the day, it's all about being part of a community, being part of a culture, and offering being at the best place that you can offer the most value to. So, and we try to do that with our guys. And I think the turning point was right around. Um, our second and a half year, or basically our third year, it was in between there, Travis, to answer your question. Nice. Uh, what percentage of your business is currently RA, OA, wholesale, and PL? So basically, I would say we're 70, 10, 10, 10 right now. It's RA and then the rest are split about the same. Um, at, that very, at this very moment, OA is super down. PL and wholesale are up tremendously. Uh, we're really pushing wholesale. We really pushed wholesale this year. So we started doing wholesale uh, really heavily in the beginning of January or end of January, early February. And we're already up to about 60K a month in just wholesale. And then last month we were at 70K on private label. So not, not too shabby. Nice. Now, have you guys brought on team members to try to manage that and grow those? Or are you guys taking the reins there until you have everything in place the way you want it? Uh, so to answer your question, that so Max and myself, I would say Max is putting more effort towards the private label than myself. And then I uh, really I was the one that really took the initiative on getting some pl things in place for wholesale, but I'm not the one in charge of it. I'm, I'm more of just, I said, hey, uh, CJ is actually our guy in charge of wholesale, basically. But we have our main shopper also does wholesale, too. He goes, he just got back from a, a show in, in New York. And so 
we we really just give the opportunity to any of the guys that are on commission to pursue wholesale or RA if they have the opportunity to. And it, it did get a little messy at some times where like, hey, look, everyone was just chasing the, the shiny thing over the trench, you know. And so really CJ was our, our main main go-to guy for, for wholesale and still has been. has done an excellent job, like absolutely killed it. And and Raymond, our 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 largest buyer, he teams up with him on deals now. So like, say Raymond will be at the at the trade show, and then CJ will be back at the at the warehouse scanning and, and checking the list that were coming in instantly. So really like, because if you, you can really impress and impress an, an agent if you make an order basically within the same day or within a couple of hours, they're they're like, whoa, I can't believe you you're you're ready for, to do this. Are you sure? And uh, it, it just is impressive when you can be right and be uh, active in, in those responses to them. And so, yeah. All right, that's, that's a good idea. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, this is, this is an interesting. Do you guys co-mingle? Do you label everything? Uh, and then do you separate out your, your different businesses amongst different Amazon seller accounts? Uh, do you have a, a wholesale account that, and a retail arbitrage account uh, just for protection purposes? Uh, yes, we do. So we actually have, we have four accounts now. And so, and wait, we're one quick, oh, so we don't do any commingle. We do, we will label everything. And so our four accounts, so we have our main account, that's our arbitrage, wholesale, online arbitrage account. Then we have a, a private label account, which which was approved by Amazon. So those are the two legitimate accounts if you were to say and then the other two are separate business businesses that are different uh partnerships one's a partnership on a pl and then one is uh basically for all half boxed shoes um we're gonna obviously amazon doesn't want you to send in half box shoes i helped a friend sell on amazon a long time ago so that one account we don't we do all of our brown box shoes on that one account to just just let it ride until it basically gets shut down. Travis has another good question. When you send RA shoppers on overnight trips, uh, what are you paying for and what are they paying for? Uh, we pay for, it depends. Sometimes if it's a long trip, we'll, we'll pay for gas or, or split the gas. Uh, we normally, the rule of thumb that we go for on any of the trips, it's usually a hundred dollars per ho per night is what we're willing to offer. So if it, if it costs them 120, uh, they pay for the 120 and, and we re reimburse 100. And so that way, because you can get a hotel at $100, but if you want something nice, you can get something for 150 bucks and stay at only stay in there for you know 50 dollars. That's not bad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, now that you guys have so many moving moving parts, what? Uh, what do you guys do to stay on top of everything? How do you make sure that uh, how do you make sure that you're keeping track of the things that are important and and what and things like that? You hire good people. That is what you do, 100. percent And we obviously we use inventory management software, but honestly, it's our team that that are is our because especially if you have your employees on a commission based off of the profit, they're they're definitely going to make sure that their products are processed correctly. And if there's an issue, I'm usually the first to hear about it. And, and then we have to figure out what the issue is and go to the prepper or the, or the buyer and see what was labeled, what was labeled wrong, what was mispriced, what was priced for, what, how can we fix this, this issue? And, and so the way what's set up is, is a good accountability structure to, for the buyers. So that way they're, they're obviously getting paid on their, off of the gross profit of their of their sales so they they're definitely conscious of of what is being priced at what and what is being sent out just to make sure that everything is accounted for so it's, it's a good accountability system and uh, now it's to the point where when the buyer drops this is our process our whole process it's kind of complicated if I speak about it but it I'll just walk you through it so the guy shops in the store that receipt is labeled on a tag. That tag says Raymond underscore Polo underscore date underscore time, and then and then labeled on that on that tag. 
or on that bag. So if there's six bags, they all have that same tag, and it might be written on the bag Raymond 1 or R1. That way you can know, like, if you throw it all in a trailer, you would be able to recognize all of the R1s. You can match all the R1s up together. So then when they're scanned in, it, every receipt is a different batch. So we do every single batch as a different receipt within Inventory Lab, if you're following me. So when you're in Inventory Lab, you that same, same title is the same exact same name as the batch. That way you can follow the product as it goes through the prepping process to that exact batch and never actually have a a mistake or issue you should be able to check check it up to that to that receipt very easily search it we scan it in on on evernote and and it we use the fujitsu scan snap scanner and it instantly scans it into the computer and then we can when we're list when the guy is listing the product through inventory lab he has one screen open uh control f scanning the the product on that receipt and then popping it up and then as soon as he gets it he labels it and then go on and then let's say the pro let's say a, an issue comes up with the prepper the prepper is prepping the product and turns out the product is uh, messed up there's like a ripped box so that ripped box goes into a to a return pile basically that we return to the store with the receipt and then also if the, we also, we have a pile for all the products that are considered overstock where we can't send any more products of the any more of those products in, so we have a pile for that too, and that nice. way it's always always accounted for <laughs> on wherever it goes. Awesome, Chaz has a great question. Um, what kind of profit margins do you guys aim with to make sure that you, of course, stay profitable, but also are keeping your inventory moving fast? So as of lately, we've been staying around twenty one percent. Last year we were around twenty seven percent, but we were also doing half as much volume as last year. And so we've definitely decreased our profit margin a little bit, uh, but we've increased our volume tremendously. So it's something that it's hard to, hard to say what's better because you're getting so much cash back in order for you to buy more product. And you actually end up, it, the profit is pretty dang close to the same, uh, whether it's, um, volume oriented or profit oriented, but on a daily basis, we're on right on 20, 21% of gross profit. Nice. And this is a question that I wouldn't expect you to necessarily have, but do you know what your inventory turn rate is? Like how often you're, you're turning your inventory over? It, it's hard to say because if you include, uh, say discontinued items, it's hard. You can't, those items are going to take forever to sell. Uh, so, but we, we try to stay on a 90 day window and we're, we're trying to even cut it closer to 60 days. And now with that higher turn rate increases our volume, which allows us to, to buy more product. It just, it all depends on the product. That's why it's so hard because one scenario you may have a discontinued product. One scenario you may have, you went super deep on it and you're not going to sell all of them in 60 days. So you just can't do it or you're going to lose money. And so the, it's just hard to say you can't, you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got a couple more questions and then I'm going to go to the rapid fire round uh, and, and give everybody a, an opportunity to, to think about what they might want to ask. Uh, Travis says, is the decrease in margin because of lowered buying standards or because of higher operating costs due to the growth? Uh, definitely not higher operating costs. It's more of because of the, the growth of the sales. So for example, wholesale, our average ROI is probably 44% uh, our return on investment, not not gross profit margin. Uh, so that is definitely going to pull you down, pull your, your ROI or your gross profit margin lower. And we're okay with that because we're, we're moving inventory so quickly and that's fine with us. And, and honestly, we let our guys decide if they're willing to to go for those lower ROI items. Because it, if you're going to buy a wholesale item and it sells at 44%, but you're selling tens of thousands a month, it's not a bad buy. You know They're okay with getting a lesser percent of that lower ROI, but you're moving product super fast, so it's okay. Now, at, at, where at the only time that we really kind of like 
uh, say, hey, we need to not, we can't go that low, would be on shoes because shoes have such a high return rate as in customer return rate. So we have to be careful on on how low we go on on shoes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chaz is curious. Would you buy a product with a high rank but no sellers? Uh, we don't. We do that sometimes. It's very rare. Uh, it just depends on the the situation. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, I'm going to move into the the lightning round and and. I explain this every week to, to people. I've taken Tim Ferriss's rapid fire questions and I've kind of uh, redone them a little bit toward the FBA community. Um, if you guys have your own questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to those as soon as I go through this. Um, but uh, when you think of the word successful, who's the first person in the Amazon community that comes to mind? Oh, uh, probably Sam Cohen. Nice. Uh, do you have a book, a blog post, or a piece of literature that you recommend the most? And this can be just to other business people or to people who uh, are really interested in getting into selling on Amazon. Um, for selling on Amazon, or I would just say you, every every single person, every single Amazon seller should read Shoe Dog by um, Knight. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, I just Phil read Knight. it. It's Phil Knight. Yes. Amazing. Read that book. It's not based on Amazon, but it will give you the perspective of an Amazon seller. Interesting. I, I passed over it at the airport and I almost bought it. So I'll, uh, I'll be ordering that tonight. Um, this one's kind of weird. Not everybody can answer this one. So what's something you believe about e-commerce or selling on Amazon that others might find weird or crazy? What others? Hmm. I don't know. I'm not really sure on that one. Uh, I would say uh, weird or crazy. The, the fact I can go buy in a, a this is happens all the time. I I tell people I'll retail arbitrage, and they look at look at me like, how do you make money? And it never re like realizes in someone's head that I can go buy stuff at a retail value and sell it for more on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... What are some common misconceptions about selling on Amazon you think people have? I would say they don't see the amount of time and, and effort that is put on the prep side, if, especially in a retail arbitrage business. Yeah, uh, yeah, no kidding. Um, what's the most useful software or product that you've purchased for your business in the last year? Inventory Lab, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Um, all right. Let's answer some of your guys' questions. Uh, Travis says, do you ever have to worry about cash flow? Do you ever have to tell your buyers to slow down? We used to until recently. Uh, we were able to get our first line of credit and loan from an actual bank. Uh, we got an SBA loan, and that really ch changed our business. There Now we rarely ever have that issue or we haven't had that issue since then. Awesome. Uh, John is curious, do you deal with retail corporate offices to buy in bulk or are you just buying in bulk from wholesalers? Uh, uh, we, we buy in bulk from the store directly, but uh, like I talked to you about that volleyball, for example, I, I was, I was telling the, someone else about this recently too. And so basically we, we found that deal by my friend, by Lance, the banker that told us that uh, that gave us the loan with the loan shark guy. And he came to me. He's like, hey, man, this he sends me a picture of this baseball bat for 100 bucks in Academy Sports. And so he sent me this baseball bat and, and he goes, hey, are th is this a good buy? And of course, I, I have a good conscience. And I go, uh, yes, if you don't buy them all, I'm going to buy them. And so he goes, let me call my wife real quick. So he calls his wife and he buys about $20,000 worth of these bats. And I, we bought the rest. We went, there was about $10,000 left. And, and we bought all these bats. And the next thing you know, uh, we contact Wilson directly. So after, after we sold those bats, we're like, man, let's just call Wilson and see if, if they would open an account with us. So, I called Wilson. I go, hey, look, I just bought 200 bats from your 
academy sports that you're selling bats to. And I, I'm, I just don't want to understand like, why am I not buying these directly from you? And they're like, and the lady goes, let me connect you with our sales department. And so I get connected with our, our the local sales rep in Jacksonville. And sure enough, I go, look, I'm interested in buying these bats. I would love to talk to you more about this. And, um, Let's see if we can get a deal. Well, he's like, well, there's no more bats available, but I do have our wholesale and our closeout list. And that's how we found the, the volleyballs. Nice. That's awesome. Um, Brandon has an interesting question. Uh, what is your end game with Amazon? Is it something that you mm. guys foresee long into the future? Is it, uh, is it a stepping stone to something else? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Excellent question. And so I would say... Definitely, Amazon's a definitely a progression. I mean, I don't think Amazon's going anywhere, and I don't think that we're going to really leave Amazon completely. Or I would rather add things in addition to Amazon, say, for example, click funnels or outside traffic to my direct site. And and that's something that, that we are really trying to do. Uh, we're launching a, a, a larger PL brand here pretty soon, and we're going to try to knock it out of the park on outside of Amazon also. So we'll see how it goes and wish us the best of luck because it's really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's And I talked about this last week. Uh, you know, Galena was the, was the name of the lady that I interviewed and, and she oh, also yeah, sells, and sells on, yeah, she sells on Shopify and, you know, mm -hmm. running outside traffic and things is important. And uh, I hope that more and more sellers start to do that. Not only, not only to kind of insulate ourselves from what may come down the pike, but also just to be able to have a customer list. And, and that really is so important. Um, I, I'm going to have to kick this other girl in Sullivan. I don't know where the heck they got this uh, link or how they're getting in, but oh, well, um, did you, have I would to say for, for the end game, yeah. I would say eventually to sell a, a private label brand for sure. And then, um, just keep on going with e-commerce. I mean, I don't see it going anywhere. I think it's only going to continue to grow. And uh, and uh, we always say this all the time. The best time to start selling online was five years ago, but the second best time is right now. So if you're not selling online, definitely get involved. It's a good time to do it. And we are still way ahead of the curve. Absolutely. And that's interesting. You say so you say sell a private label brand. I would imagine you mean actually sell the business uh, or do you just want to be able to have it as an asset forever? No, I would love to. Uh, I would love to sell one in the next, you know, year, year and a half. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Grant is curious. How much do you guys buy at full retail price compared to discount stores, clearance, and that kind of thing? Mm, good question. Mm, most of the items are at some sort of, say, clearance or uh, off price off price store, say Marshall's TJ Maxx, but most of our products come from the outlets on a day-to-day -day basis. Nice. Um, and you don't have to answer this one if you don't want to, but did you have to use any assets to secure your SBA loan? Uh, yeah, I've never had I an had SBA to, loan, so I don't know. I had to put a lien on my condo that I bought in December, but I mean, nice. a condo, I put seven grand down on a $135,000 condo. So big collateral, in my opinion. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chaz curious, how do you fund your sourcers? Uh, do you use credit cards? Do you uh, do reimbursements? Um, and I guess, how do you keep track of all that? I do not like doing reimbursements. And I usually get on to our, one of our buyers whenever he does that. But I, we, we have company cards. We recently, got a very large credit limit on a an American Express Platinum card. And we every one of our employees basically has that card now. And we are trying to push everyone to using only that card unless they're buying with gift cards. Nice. Uh, and that's a great that's a great segue to Joseph's question. Uh, do all of your buyers utilize gift cards? And I guess what maybe what percent of your purchases are coming through with gift cards? Ooh, not as many as I would hope, but I, I, it's hard to say. Uh, probably, That's, probably fi not even 50%, 40%. 
at scale, that seems like a rather difficult thing to be able to to handle. Uh, I would imagine. So I sure, mean, we, you could buy. We have a, yeah, what we do is typically we whenever there's a big sale coming, say, good example is Nike Friends and Family Sale, and whenever that sale is coming, we usually the guys at gift cards in or ABC gift cards are already calling us, telling us, Hey, we got all these cards coming in down the pipeline. Are you interested in buying them? And we're like, of course. And so when you buy, I say over a hundred thousand dollars worth of gift cards, you're going to get a different percent than, than the person that buys only $5,000. So we're typically able to get a really, really high percent. And there's certain stores that, that like say, uh, there's certain malls that will give, like, say, a hundred dollar. You buy a hundred dollar gift card and you get a fifteen dollar gift card for free, but you have to. You can only spend X amount of dollars per person per day for ten days. So you really have to like go out and scramble and get all those cards. Now, that was that's kind of scary because I'm buying two hundred thousand dollars worth of gift cards. I actually ended up opening safety deposit boxes at my bank because I didn't want to keep that at my house. I felt felt weird. And, uh, yeah. Um, Ivor has a question. Without giving away any secret sauce, how do you guys find or identify good discounted items? Good discounted items? So the big thing is really, one, going in when there's a, re a sale or an opportunity in a sale. And there's always going to be opportunity in, in the clearance section, you know. But is really going to and building that relationship relationship i can't push that enough i mean go into your stores make sure that they know who you are and make sure that they will go out of their way to make to to uh to go out of their way for you and i think that's so important and basically yeah i mean you can really go into any of the outlets and really find great deals on a daily basis just call ahead of time see what deals each store is running if the deal, if a store is running a good deal, uh, go in and scan the whole store. I mean, sure, you're going to spend five hours scanning a whole store, but if you find 10 items that make you a grand, I think you'll be okay with that. And so, yeah. Uh, have you guys uh, branched out to Jet or Walmart yet? We tried Walmart. We are not on Jet as of now. And Walmart was a letdown. No, we weren't pleased. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we do, we do do Joe, uh, Joe Lister. Oh, we, we do Joe Lister. If no one's doing that, that's a great way to merge all of your, your Amazon listings. And yeah, it's a, like extra 5% of revenue is from Joe Lister. But you may think that's not much, but when you're doing millions of, out of let's say you do a million dollars that's 50k of revenue you know that's not bad yeah yeah absolutely it, for basically little to no work since it's all automatic it's great mm -hmm. um travis is curious how many businesses do you have and what entities did you start <laughs> we have several businesses we have um several pl businesses we have our uh consulting business we have our main amazon business we have um we have a, a retail store here, and so we're about up to about five different businesses. Nice. Are you guys getting a fair amount of foot traffic in your retail business? <laughs> Since inception in February first, we've had we've done a total of about eight hundred dollars in revenue. So yeah. big money in the retail yeah. business, but it's opened a lot of doors for wholesalers. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what's important. Um, all right. Oh, Barb has a has a quick question, and then uh, we are coming up on an hour, guys. So I'm going to start wrapping this up. Uh, but Barb says, "Have you ever gone to an outlet uh, to purchase a lot of inventory, and the manager told you it's illegal to purchase items to resell?" Uh, yes, definitely 110 uh, percent, and it happens. And I've definitely had a couple managers who just do not like me, and I don't know what I did to the to deserve their hatred, but it's, uh, it happens. And when that happens, you kind of just say, okay, thank you. Um, now you can try to fight it and you can try to get them to call some other manager somewhere else, but really 
most of the time it's more of it just to say, hey, thank you. I appreciate for you letting me at least come in and check out your items. Have a great day. And because if you were to go and fight it and you're really just building bad rapport on yourself already and it just doesn't end well at all. Yeah, absolutely. And there's plenty of other places. I mean, just go to the next door. It's it's not, not going to kill you. Um, okay, so you guys have a course coming out. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about your group and, and how we can learn more about that. Awesome. Yeah, so Seller Systems is what I'm, I'm wearing. Our, our group is Seller Systems Succeeding on Amazon. And basically, we, we created this course one of two reasons. One reason is we saw all these people teaching the game of Amazon, but not actually doing the game of Amazon. So we were just like, man, all these guys are talking the talk, but they don't really walk the walk. And we're like, man, we can definitely provide these people much, much more value, value than a lot of the people out there. We also uh, were like, man, all these people contact us all the time for help and ask us for help. And we were giving freely for the longest time. And we were getting to the point where like, we were, it was just hurting us, you, you know, like we were, we were, we would spend more time helping people, which is, which is great, but we were, we weren't getting out anything out of it. And so we're like, you know what, it's time to start charging people for, for help. And so we created seller systems and basically we, we partnered also with Brandon Young just because one, we're, we're obviously retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, and wholesale sellers, and we do we do well in PL, but we're not. I wouldn't. We're not at the same level as him. We're we're on track to doing 10 million on the reselling side. He's on track to do 10 million on the PL side. So we were like, you know what? This is a good opportunity for us to team up. Let's do it. You know what you're doing. We know what we're doing. Let's crush it. So we wanted to start telling and teaching people our ways of Amazon. And uh, right now we have our beta program. And this is for only beta users, which is the last sign up date is July 1st. We start our our course and teaching people how to sell on Amazon, what we do on a daily basis, and just going to provide as much value as we can to those to those clientele. But we really need help from those people to really give us as much input and help us make our program as good as it can be, because this is the cheapest it's going to be ever. It's going to be 9.97 now for beta users we just want to get as much feedback from you guys and help you guys as much as we can and then transfer that into uh, a couple months down the road probably august 1st or september 1st we're launching our full-on full course and we want to make sure that it's perfect for them so looking uh, forward if, if, anyone... if somebody wanted to find it where would they go i have the link here um if is there a way to can I post it in the messenger message yeah, right here? Yeah. yeah, throw it right in the messages. So, so that's our that's our basically it tells you about what we're offering and there's only sixteen days left to to sign up. And yeah, so we'll have office hours, we have a full inner circle group. And that's really I honestly I think our, our inner circle group is is by far the most valued portion of our of our business because we're going to take the time and really make sure that everyone is satisfied and, and go out of the way to make sure that the people in our group are really going to be successful. Like we shared a bolo that I honestly, I kind of felt bad that we shared it because it was almost too good to share. And uh, we, we shared a bolo in that group and, and we, we pr will probably make about 40 to 50 grand profit in the next 90 days on that one bolo. And, Many many of our group members were able to go out and buy it, and we've already had a couple of them make make sales on it. So it's awesome seeing that. Uh, I just hope that they don't expect that to be every single time because that was almost <laughs> too good to be to re to replace. You know. No, that's that's great. Um, yeah, everybody, I would if you if you're interested in that, make sure to head over there. I'll make sure that that link is available uh, on YouTube and and during the replay and everything. Um, Garland, I appreciate you being here, man. Uh, I do want to respect your time, and we've gone just a touch over an hour, so I don't want to keep you anymore. But uh, I appreciate you coming in. I appreciate you sharing your your uh, knowledge. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Chris, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. All right, guys, have a great night. Thanks, guys.